We've been going through a study on the book of Philippians. How many are you enjoying the study? Really unpacking it. We're taking our time. When, I'm, when I say we're taking our time, I mean like we're, we're five weeks into it and we just completed the first chapter, okay? So week one, we did an introduction to Philippians. And the introduction to Philippians is really the story of how the Philippian church was even planted in the first place. Every church has a beginning, and so we shared that with you, and it was out of Acts chapter 16. And then in, in, in week two, then we unpacked, as Paul begins the letter to the Philippian church, which is really a thank you letter for them sowing financially into him as he's sitting under house arrest in, by, by, in Rome, he writes this thank you letter, and he begins it sharing that he's a bond servant of Christ. And so we took time to unpack that. And then in week three, we went through process and promise, realizing that we're all in process, but we all have a promise. Amen? And then in week four, we unpacked apologetics. Paul was a defender of the faith, and he was known for lovingly having conversations with people and challenging what they believe and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and why they can have confidence that Jesus really lived, really died, really rose again from the grave, that he really is the son of God. And so Paul unpacks that, and so we spent some time in apologetics in week four, defending the faith, and then in week five, we unpacked God's purpose and his plan for our lives. And today, I want to talk to you about the power of unity. Unity is one of the most beautiful things. When you see people who are unified, when you meet a church that's unified, when you see a sports team that's unified, man, it's a beautiful thing. When there's disunity, when there's division, it's ugly. <laughs> it's like you don't want to be around it. You don't want to be in that house. You don't want to be part of that company. You, want to, you don't want to be on that ball, team, that, that ball club. You, you want to get away from it. Why? There's something attractive about unity. So we're going to unpack that today. If you have your Bibles, you can open up the, the book of Philippians to chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And if you don't have your Bible, no worries. We planned in advance for you. We'll have a big Bible on the screen today. And we're going to pick it up in chapter 1. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Let's go. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my job by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Next slide. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count yourselves Count others, excuse me, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of the death, even the death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The power of unity. So question for you as we begin. What does unity look like? What does unity look like? In, in your marriage, what does unity look like? Uh, in your home with your kids, what does unity look like? Isn't it the worst when like the home is divisive. Maybe you grew up in a home like that where it just seemed like mom and dad were constantly butting heads. Maybe you're here and you're mom and dad and you are constantly butting heads. God wants to help you with that. He wants you to be unified. What does unity look like? What does unity sound like? Unity, to me, it looks like encouragement. I'm a words of affirmation guy in the five love languages, right? I'm a words of affirmation guy. And uh, one of my buddies, Marcelo, 
uh, who goes to our church here. Marcelo is one of the uh, most encouraging guys. He's also a great truth teller, gives me some good information that I need to hear, but he's also one of the most encouraging guys in my life. And unity to me looks like encouragement. U- unity to me looks like when, when you mess up, somebody says, that's okay, man, you're going to get it in the next time. That's okay. You struck out this time, you're going to get it next time. Unity looks like, you know what? Yeah, that hurt, but I love you, and I know you love me, and we're going to make it through this. Unity looks like that encouragement, that love. Unity looks like grace. Unity looks like forgiveness. What does unity look like to you? With unity, when there's unity, there's momentum. When... If you're, if, you're, if you're on the crew team, we sh- my wife and I, we sh- saw this movie a few months ago called Boys in the Boat. It was about a, a team out of the University of Washington uh, back in, I think it was back in the, the 30s or 20s maybe. But it was, it was a bunch of guys that were on crew, and so they're rowers. And, uh, and in that, you could see when there was unity, they had so much momentum. And some of these guys that were in the boat were not the strongest, not the biggest, not necessarily the fastest, but they could work well with each other. And when they worked well with each other, they won. When they didn't, when they tried to outdo one another, when they tried to to one-up each other, then they fell behind. And I, I just think that there's so much momentum that can happen when we're unified. There's momentum that can happen as a church when we're unified. There's momentum that can happen in the body of Christ when we're unified, like what's happening this weekend with Baptized California, where we literally have hundreds of churches from San Diego and Oceanside and Huntington Beach and Palm Springs and Redondo Beach and Ventura and where else? Bakersfield, Fresno, San Jose. There's gonna be, I think, 50 to 100 people getting water baptized under the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. There's people getting water baptized up in Redding. There's people getting water baptized in Sacramento all the way up to Eureka. Like there's the church is coming together. What can God do? What kind of momentum can happen when we're unified? Unity. But let me ask you this. What does disunity look like? Disunity. Disunity is one that's full of critics pointing out what other people did wrong. Disunity is you did that, you did that, you did this. Disunity is never taking blame for anything that you did. Disunity gets caused by constantly pointing out faults in other people's lives. And sadly, I've seen it before in the church. And I just think it's ugly. I think if, the, if, the, if there's one place that should be the most encouraging, loving, gracious, kind, patient, forgiving, laugh it off, it's in the church. It's in the church. And so I want to unpack unity just a little bit. You know, Paul said in that, that verse we just read, Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, talking about unity, he tells him, he goes, I want you guys complete my joy. Complete it. I'm, I'm, I'm joyous, I'm happy, I'm thankful, I'm grateful. I want you to complete my joy by being of the same mind, same love, full accord of one mind. Can we say that? Same mind, same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What does that sound like when you hear that? Full accord, one mind, same love. What does that look like? To me, that looks like the book of Acts. And so one of the most famous passages of Scripture as it pertains to an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the power and presence of God is found in the book of Acts. And so we're going to jump to there. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, which today is the day of Pentecost. I'm going to unpack that in a second. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's unity. And suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So they didn't say that there was a mighty rushing wind. It was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Unity has a sound. Unity has a sound. Unity in your home has a sound. There's a sound of unity. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them. 
Now pause here just for a moment. The disciples are having this encounter, this earth, wind, and fire type of a moment. And you're like, what is happening? There's wind, there's tongues of fire. Like, this is crazy. Like, you know, what's going on here? Let me just unpack that just for a second. So wind in the Bible always symbolized the power of God. When God caused wind, wind symbolized the power of God. Ezekiel 37 verse 9 this is when Ezekiel is called to prophesy to that valley of dry bones. Then he said to me, God said to him, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So he tells him, I want you to prophesy, and then the winds are going to get stirred up, and the things that were dead are going to come back to life. But he tells you to speak it, and then he comes and he confirms it, and he brings wind. The second thing is fire. Fire symbolizes the presence of God. Exodus 13, 21, there's a story of the children of Israel. They're coming out of Egypt, and God is providing for them supernaturally. And it says in the Bible that he would go before them. He would lead them along the way, and by night he was a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So there was a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. When you take a look at the fire of God, fire often represents his presence. When God speaks to Moses in the burning bush, it was the fire of God, it was the presence of God drew him in. There's something about the presence of God. So there's the wind of God, that's the power. There's the fire of God, that is the presence of God. So there's this sound of rushing wind in Acts chapter 2. There's what looks like tongues of fire. Let's keep reading. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled. Does it say some of them were filled? No. Some people say, I don't believe that everybody can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Really? So you disagree with the Bible, oh expert theologian. You're obviously smarter than God. No. He says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God works in redemption. So this is a reversal of what happened with the tower uh, of, in Babylon, in Babel. That tower they were building, they were unified, and they found out, wow, if we're unified, we can build, and, and we can build a tower that would go up to heaven. And so God says, there's, there's too much dependence on each other. I want them to learn to depend on me again. And so he scattered their languages. This is a reverse of what happened with the Tower of Babel, where suddenly they were united in one spirit, one accord. But then the spirit of God began to speak. And so God's redeeming what, what happened with that moment. So God redeems. And this is uh, freaking out the city. Like, as you can imagine, people come running from all over the place. They hear this sound of a rushing wind, and then the disciples come out, and all of them, they're, they're speaking in these other tongues, and people are like, what in the world is going on here? We're hearing the gospel be preached in our own languages, and there were people from all over the place. So they're hearing this, and they're like, what is this? And some of them are saying, dude, they're just drunk. Like, they have lost their minds, these crazy Jesus followers. They're, they're drunk. And Peter gets up. And this is his first time preaching a message, right? The last time we see Peter, what happened? He was denying Jesus by a fire. He was, he was saying no to a little girl that's like, aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? I don't even know him, right? Jesus, he, he denies Jesus in that moment. And now here Peter is, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he walks in boldness. He goes from being a wimp to a courageous warrior. And he rips a message. He doesn't even have time to write his own. He just rips a message from the prophet Joel. He's like, I'm going to steal Joel's message. So he shares what prophet Joel said. The prophet Joel said this, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Can we say that together? All flesh. So this was, this was Pentecost. He goes on to say, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. This is Pentecost, and you're going, great, that's cool. I'm brand new to faith. I'm brand new to the Bible. What the heck is Pentecost, and why should I care? Great, great question. Pentecost is Pentecoste in the Greek, and it actually was the Greek term 
for a festival in the Old Testament that God had the children of Israel remember and celebrate every single year. And it was known as the Feast of Weeks. So when you read the Old Testament, what God ends up doing is he starts setting a pattern in place for the children of Israel that is pointing to when Jesus would come on the earth. Hebrews talks about Jesus being the lamb who was slain. You know what it said about him? It says that before the foundations of the world, Jesus was slain. So the Bible is basically saying, yeah, he might have been slain on a cross 2,000 years ago, but he was actually slain before the foundations of the world were even made. And that's a little bit too much for my three-pound fallen brain to fully comprehend, but there was some sort of a conversation that happened with the Godhead, being Father, Son, Holy Spirit, before the world's created, where they're having a conversation, and this is just how I picture it going. There's no factual representation for this. This isn't scripture. This is just my thoughts on what might have happened, okay? So I'm taking some creative liberty right now, okay? So don't, like, hit me up with a bunch of emails saying, Pastor Jeff, where is that in scripture? Okay, it's not. We just know that before the foundations of the world, Jesus was slain. And there was some sort of conversation that happened between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Where they're going to create man, but before they make man, they want to create a world for man. And the reason they're creating the world isn't to have a world. They're creating the world so that man, whom they love, could live. Why did he create people in the first place? Love. That's it. That's lo- Why did you procreate? Why did you have kids? Love. Or it might have been an accident. <laughs> you know, he... He loves you. Like, he, he had a desire. He loves you, so he created human beings. And he created the earth and placed us here to have dominion. But they knew that at some point, we're going to screw it up. And that's okay. And even knowing that you're going to screw it up, he still loves you. In fact, he tells us in Romans that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody falls short of his glorious standard. We know that. That's why Christ died. So because... He knew that we were going to screw it up. They're like, well, what are we going to do? How would we bring them back when they have sin in their life? How would we bring them back into the presence of us who are holy? And somewhere along the lines, Jesus is kind of like the one that says, I'll go. I'll go. I'll become a man. So I'll be the God man. And I'll be that perfect sacrifice to reconcile them back to us. And they're like, that's a great idea. So then they create the world. They place man there. Man gets in the garden. Adam and Eve have a time. And then what happens? They fumble the ball. Satan picks up the ball, and he's running it to the finish line. And before he gets to the finish line, Christ goes to the cross. And the devil thinks that he won. But actually, going to the cross was the fulfillment of God's plan. So what he thought was like, hooray. No, no, no. Aslan laid down his life freely so that you and I could have eternal life. And so we've been reconciled back to God. So then there's all these feasts that God set up along the way in the Old Testament so that it would be so easy to see, oh, so Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So what they did, God set up these festivals. And we see this throughout the scriptures. There was Pentecost, but there was, it began with Passover. So Passover, Jesus was the Passover lamb. Right, We celebrate that at Good Friday. So Good Friday service, it's good for us. It wasn't good for Jesus. Jesus was the Passover lamb. Then there's the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits is when Jesus was resurrected, Easter Sunday. So he fulfilled that. And then the day of Pentecost was the Feast of Week. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gets poured out, what we just read, on the day commemorating the giving of the Torah and the beginning of the summer harvest season. So what they would do, the reason it's called called the Feast of Weeks is because after Passover, you would begin to count off 50, that's where we get Penta from, 50, so Pentecost, 50 days from that day, and then that would be the, the Feast of Weeks would begin. And that would be heading into the summer harvest. So God sets up all these feasts. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, the children of Israel celebrating all these feasts. Jesus celebrated all these feasts growing up. He celebrated all these feasts 
with his disciples. And then he became the Passover lamb. Then he was the first fruits. Then the Holy Spirit's poured out on the day of Pentecost, symbolizing the harvest that's coming. And on that day, in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were added to the church. Passover represents redemption. The Holy Spirit represents revelation. Let me unpack this for a second. When the children of Israel left Egypt, it took them a while to get Egypt out of them. So they experienced redemption. But it wasn't in really until the Joshua generation that they had the revelation. If you are saved, you're redeemed, but you don't have revelation of what God did in your life, you'll never experience transformation and you could have a propensity to go back into your old ways. We have some friends of ours, they work a lot with prison ministries. And in prison ministries, uh, a lot of the, the areas where they're working in, there's a lot of repeat offenders. So somebody goes to jail, and they're in jail, and they, they establish a, a, a rhythm and a routine while they're in jail, and then they let, get let out. And when they're out of jail, they don't know what to do. And many of them end up going back to their old ways. They've been set free but the freedom really isn't in them and they don't have that fresh revelation and then they do something else, sometimes worse, and it throws them back into the place where they started to find their identity. That's why it's so important for you to find your identity in Christ. If you experience redemption of salvation without revelation, you'll have the propensity to do exactly what the Israelites were doing. They're in the desert, they're like, Send us back to Egypt. It was so much better for us in Egypt. And Moses is like, are you nuts, man? Like, are you crazy? Like, you guys were slaves making bricks and building buildings. Like, you want to go back to that? You're nuts. But that, and it seems so illogical when you read it, right? You ever read the Bible and you're like, man, the Israelites are so stupid. What in the world is wrong with them? Get it together. Until you look in the mirror and you're like, that's me. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace, you know. Redemption without revelation could lead you back into slavery. Baptism is so critical. John said this about Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, I, John the Baptist, I baptize you with water. Everybody say water. For repentance. But he, Jesus, who is coming after me, is mightier than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and Fire. So there's three baptisms in Christianity. I don't know if you know this or not. Some of you know it because you've been at Authentic Church and you're learning and you're growing and, and God's expanding your revelation. But the three baptisms of Christianity, I find a lot of people don't realize. Number one, the first one is you are baptized in the Holy Spirit at salvation. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the family of God when you're saved. So you've all been baptized into the family of God when you're saved. That's the first baptism. The second baptism is when a disciple baptizes you in water. The third baptism, just like John said, the one coming after me, I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He's going to baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and fire. Who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit? Jesus. So Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. Now the word baptize, let me unpack that for a second. Baptize is a word we get from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo. It means to plunge, immerse, dip, submerge, or soak. So what in the world does that mean? Baptizo. Dip, immerse, soak. That the, They got the word for baptism not based on a religious activity. They actually got the word baptizo from a, a way that a garment maker would dip a garment in dye until the dye was fully saturated in that garment and then they would take it out. So Lydia, who was one of the first members of the Philippian church, remember she was a, deal, a dealer in purple goods. Well, purple was rare and it was expensive. Why? Because to get a deep color purple, it had to sit in the dye longer, right? Anything that's gonna take longer any project that you're going to do for your business, if it's going to take longer, it's going to cost more money to the client. 
So it would take longer for that dye to really saturate every fiber of the garment that they were wanting to dye into that beautiful purple color. So they would take the garment, and she would have a basin of, of dye, purple, and then she'd put the garment in there, and then they would take this pole, and they would push it down, and they would agitate the water to the point where the dye now was getting into every fiber of that garment, and she would then leave it in there for a period of time and go start on the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And Lydia probably had people that worked for her. She, she was a successful businesswoman. People in her household probably lived with her, and they worked for her. And so they would do that, and they would set it, and they would figure out how long that's been in that tub over here and how long in this basin here. And then at the right time, they would take it out. And when it comes out, it looks the way the garment maker wants it to look. Come on, this is good. It looks the way the garment maker wants it to look. Sometimes we want to come out of submersing and spending time soaking in the presence of God too fast. He's like, I just want to agitate the water a little bit more. I need to work some things in the fiber of your being. You need to soak in my presence a little more. So they would do that. And the goal being that when you come up out of the waters, you look the way the garment maker wanted you to make. Now, I know if you're hearing this message and you're getting water baptized today, you're like, so are you just going to hold me down underwater until there's no more bubbles? <laughs> Hopefully not, man. Hopefully you repent early. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, you're going to go down and come right back up. <laughs> but you follow me. Like soaking in the presence of God, spending time. When we're talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, some people are like, oh, yeah, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit like 15 years ago. Great. How, how's your life since then? Oh, it's been like a roller coaster. Okay, well, that's not God's design. He actually designed you to go from glory to glory. You're going to have trials and tribulations. It's going to come to everybody. But his, his desire is that even if there's little downs, you're, you're trending upward, if that makes sense. Another aspect of being baptized is, I have a picture up here of a sword and a hammer. Being baptized, they, they would, the blacksmith would create the sword, and then you would go out, and you would have a battle, and you would come back. Well, in the course of the battle, what happens to the sword? It gets banged up. The sword gets a little bit dented. It might get bent, and the sword might get dull. So then the blacksmith will take the sword, put it into the fire, follow me, and he would get it until it's super hot, where it's like melting the sword. And then he'd pull it out of that, and he'd, he'd put it on the anvil, and he'd begin to hammer it, and he'd hammer out every blemish of that sword, every dull area, and he would hammer it until it was back perfect. And then he would baptize it in water, and you would just hear this tss. And then he'd let it cool down for a while and let it settle. And then he'd put it back in the fire and he'd do it again. Pull it out and hammer it and baptize it again. Some of you are warriors and your sword is a little bit dull. There's, there's some marks of some battles you've been through. Some stuff you're not proud of. Some stuff that really hurt you. And God's saying, would you just let me put that into my furnace? Can I just put that into my fire? And then I'm going to take it out. And I know it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's going to be good for you. I'm going to, I'm going to hammer some things out. You and me, we're going to work some things out. And then there comes that cool, refreshing moment. It's like, ah, there you are. You're back. Sometimes you stop praying too soon Sometimes, if you would just wait just a little bit longer, if you would just soak, if you would just prioritize this presence again, you would experience and encounter the power and the presence of God in baptism. Jesus wants to immerse you. He wants to soak you in the Holy Spirit today. Acts chapter 19, verse 6. Paul meets some uh, believers. They were disciples, actually. This is the planting of the church in Ephesus in Acts 19, verse 6. And he talks to them about Jesus, and he talks to them about the Holy Spirit. And these guys are like, dude, we've not even heard there was a Holy Spirit. Paul's like, what? Okay, here's the deal. So he gives them a quick theological breakdown on who the Holy Spirit is, the person, because it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Godhead. And so they're like, we're all in. So Paul then rebaptizes them in water, 
in the name of Jesus. And then when they come up out of the water, he lays his hands on them and the Holy Spirit comes on them and they speak in tongues and they prophesy. When you come into unity with the Godhead, what happens is you begin to experience the presence and power of the Holy Spirit when you come into unity with the Godhead. So a lot of people are cool with God the Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? We're cool with God as a Father. And we're, we're really cool with God as Son, right? Jesus, oh, Jesus my everything. I got a t-shirt that says Jesus. I got a Jesus sticker on my car. I got Jesus music playing in my car. Like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm, I'm about Jesus. But then some people give like this social stiff arm to the Holy Spirit as if it's like this gift from an out of touch elderly uncle or aunt at Christmas. Like you remember the Christmas story in Ralphie? Remember that? little? And he gets the bunny outfit and he's just totally dejected and his dad's laughing and his mom's kind of giggling. She's like, you have to wear it. And he's like, I feel like an idiot. That's how a lot of Christianity looks at the Holy Spirit. They're like, we're cool with Father God. We're cool with Jesus as a son. But the Holy Spirit, like, I don't know, keep that Shabbat to yourself, right? They're just kind of like, they, they, it, it feels different. If, if, if I was Satan and I wanted to produce a powerless Christian or a powerless church, wouldn't you make everything that God had for them just feel awkward and weird? Like, oh man, that's so weird. I mean, like, and dude, I get it. And just like the people that were gathered on the, in the book of Acts, like they're, they all come, but they're like kind of freaked out. Like, tongues of fire? What in the world are you talking about? Now, if you were a Jewish boy or, or girl, you would have learned about tongues of fire. You say, where would you learn tongues of fire at? That seems like a New Testament thing. It's actually an Old Testament thing because on the day of Pentecost, it actually goes back to when the children of Israel in the desert were given the Ten Commandments. Moses comes down from the mountain, has a meeting with God on the mountain, on the fire of God, and God gives him the Ten Commandments. Moses comes down, and they pretty much break them as soon as they got them. <laughs> and then they, he goes back up to the mountain. God gives him ten commandments again. And this time God tells Moses, now you're going to write it. I wrote the first ones. You're going to write the second ones. So Moses gets them down. Ever wonder why they're on two tablets? Like why didn't God just write them on one? I mean, that seems more efficient to me, don't you? I mean, why, why write two post-it notes? Why just put it on, if it all fits on one, you're God. You can make it fit on one rock. Why do we got to do two? The first five talk about our relationship with God. The second five talk about our relationship with each other, right? Don't covet, don't murder, don't, you know, be an adulterer, etc. right? So the first one's all about our relationship with God. The second one is about our relationship with each other. That's why when Jesus gets asked the question, hey, what's the most important command? Like, they're going to try to trip up the rabbi. And so he tells them, love the Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he summarizes the first five and the second five. He's telling them. So Moses comes down with those two commandments, that, or the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, and on Pentecost, they would celebrate it in the Feast of Weeks as the time when it wasn't only beginning the harvest season, but it was actually a time just to honor God for giving them the word giving them the law. That's why Jesus goes on to say that you can't, it, there's coming a time where people are gonna worship me in spirit and in truth. The truth is the word of God. So we worship in spirit and the truth of God's word. If you wanna grow in encountering with the Holy Spirit, man, get into his presence, read the word of God. Every word from God is either a truth or a command, okay? So Ephesians 5.18, Paul says this, my wife quoted it last week in her sermon, Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, is that a truth or is this a command? It's a command. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a command. And if you treat the Holy Spirit like that crazy relative that wants to give you some weird, wacky gift on Christmas, you're not going to receive from him. A.W. Tozer had this to say about the Holy Spirit. He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and nobody would even know the difference. 
you could withdraw the Holy Spirit. Church has service. We sing some songs. There's a message. Have a few points. Have a bake sale. Everybody hangs out, has fellowship, coffee, donuts, and then we go home and nothing, nothing changes. But if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. The Holy Spirit distinguishes us from the world. I met with the uh, marketplace, a bunch of marketplace people on Thursday morning uh, from a marketplace ministry that we, we have here at Authentic Church. And uh, we were going around the table talking and one of the scriptures that I shared with them is when Moses is having this moment with God in Exodus 33 and he, say, he says to God, like, if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want to go with these people. Like, I cannot do it. I cannot do these people, Lord. They're crazy. <laughs> and Lord says, I will, I will send my presence with you. And he says, if your presence doesn't go, I don't want to go because your presence is the only thing that distinguishes us from the world. My question for you today, does the presence of God distinguish you from the world? And the, if the answer is no, then there's something that needs to change. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Paul, Paul writes the, the letter that we've been going through, the Philippians, but he also wrote a letter to a young protege of his named Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1 says this, Therefore I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So who stirs up the gift? Timothy. Where did the gift come from? The Holy Spirit. So Paul laid his hands on him, prayed for him, and now he's telling him, but Timothy, you got the gift, but Timothy, now it's on you. The responsibility is on you to stir it up. Who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit? Jesus, right? All right, let's say it one more time so everybody knows. Who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit? Jesus, right. But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, now that gift is on you to be a steward. So just repeat after me. Say, Jesus... You're the baptizer, so baptize me with the Holy Spirit today, right now, right here. Amen. Come on. Jesus wants to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, but once he does, now that's on you to steward the gift that he's given to you. You know, when you read through the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, there's nine fruits of the Spirit, right? Right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, you know, the thing, you know the song, right? And there's also nine gifts of this Holy Spirit. Fruit takes time to grow. Gifts you're freely given. If you don't have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life and character, then you will not have the character to be able to hold and steward the gift he's given you. That's why character is so important. So Jesus is real. If you don't know him today, there is an eternity that waits. Every single one of us. He is real. He wants to show himself to you. He wants, he wants to talk with you. And if you don't know him, I'm telling you, today has all been a setup for you to encounter him. We don't gather together for each other. Uh, we don't even gather together for somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus. That's not the purpose. The church actually was a gathering around the presence of Jesus. It was gathering around the remembrance and honoring and worship and praying. That's what the focus of the church was. It was all about Jesus. But as we gather around him, as his presence comes into this place, you encounter him. And you might have encountered him during worship or during the preaching of the word where suddenly your heart starts to pound in your chest or you feel uncomfortable or you're remembering something that you did that you wished you didn't do. And he's saying, I'm bringing that to your mind because I want to set you free of that. I want, you, I want to bless you. I don't, want you to hold, I don't want that to hold you up. Jesus wants to bless you. And if you'd like to start a real relationship with him today, then it just begins as a simple prayer. My wife and I, when we started our relationship, I made the first move and asked her out. Kind of what's happening is when you invite Jesus into your life, you're kind of taking that first step. We think it's the first step, but really... He took the first step on the cross. He's just made that invitation and he's inviting you now to respond. He's saying, would you come and be with me? Like, I want you to know me and I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. And so salvation is really our response to the invitation that he's given to you. And until you're ready to come into unity with the Godhead, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm just telling you, you might experience salvation, redemption, but you won't experience transformation through revelation without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you in that. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, 11, and we'll go back to that, and this is where we're going to close today. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Every knee is going to bow. You're either going to bow because you've surrendered your life to God, or you're going to bow forcefully going, oh man, I live my life for myself, and now I'm before him, and I cannot stand it's up to you whether you're doing it from your own humility or if he's going to have you bow in that moment and you're going to realize, man, I now see, I live my whole life and I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in his presence. I can't help but bow. And if you've already passed from this side of eternity to the next and you haven't began that relationship with Jesus, it's too late. So what the Bible says can't get to heaven and then kind of work your way up. That's not how it works. He's given you time on earth, on this planet, for you, your friends, your family, people walking down the street, people that are going to be at the beach today. He's given tons of time for them to come and repent. And he's pointing through Passover, through the first fruits, through Pentecost, all these signs pointing like a blinking sign saying, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Trust in him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's all these signs. Creation groans. Creation points that there is a God. If you reject it, why would a good God force you to live with him for all of eternity if you rejected him your whole time on earth? Because he's a good, loving, just God, he would not do that. That would make him a controlling, evil person. That's not our God. He gives you the invitation. Now what you do with it is up to you. It's up to you. Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, for those that put their faith in Christ, says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. If you are here today and you need to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, I just want to encourage us all just in this moment as we close, just go ahead and close your eyes. We're just going to have a moment of prayer as we close out today. And just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in this moment? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in this moment? I want to know you more. I want to sense your presence more. God, I, I do want to know you. And if you're here today and you don't know God, I would encourage you, call on the name of the Lord. I would encourage you right now today, just say, Lord, God, I want to know you. I remember as a young man, I knew about God. I went to church. I grew up in a great Catholic school for what it was, and I learned a lot about God, but I didn't really know God personally. Jesus wants you to know him personally. He wants to make a home in your heart. He wants to live with you. He wants you to know him, and if you want to receive him as your Lord and Savior today, my prayer is that you would just call on his name. When I got saved, I literally had a moment where I just prayed in desperation. I said, God, if you're real, then I want to know you. And he came and met with me. And maybe you're here today and you're like, God, if you are real, yeah, I would want to know you. If you pray that from an earnest heart, he's going to meet with you. And all you have to say is, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want to know you. I want a deeper relationship with you. So come and live in my heart today. Come and live in my heart today. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, oh God. Fill me with your presence, God. Fill me. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you for moving through hearts and minds. And Lord, we're asking Jesus, would you baptize us fresh with your Holy Spirit? Fill us today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're going to do today. Thank you for all the baptisms that are going to happen today, God. Thank you for the baptisms of those that are here in this room today that are going to call on the name of the Lord and go all in and be water baptized there on the beach, that they would also be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The disciples are going to baptize in water in Jesus. 
We're believing that you're going to baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire up and down the coastline of California today. In Jesus' name, amen. For more information on Authentic Church, visit us online at AuthenticOC.com.